Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves have far too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou ownst, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Well, there it is, the sonnet in English. It is an amazing thing. It's had a long history. Even though it really started out with this intense period of lots of people writing sonnets, 1590s, we'll get to that. But it stretched out and had a long-term consequence. So I'm going to give you a general introduction to it, and we'll walk through a few examples. And then you will be ready to enjoy sonnets, maybe even write sonnets of your own. So here goes. I want to take you back to the history of the sonnet. It's, it's not an original English form. It, it's actually a, an Italian form. Uh, in fact, it has a, quite an old history. The, the word sonnet means little song, sonetto. And it was way back in the early 13th century that a couple of Italians gave it its initial form, this, this short lyrical poem. And, and then it was uh, in the late 13th century, it started to have a a regularized rhyme scheme, and then it wasn't until the early 14th century that Petrarch and Dante, the heavy hitters of the Italian Renaissance, uh, published their uh, their sonnets and really started it on its way, Petrarch in particular. And Petrarch had set up all the major conventions of sonnets that would end up being carried over for the most part into the English tradition. First of all, you always had this this poet who was directly addressing or admiring a woman who stands at a distance from him is somehow unreachable, maybe because she's already married, or maybe because she's of a different, a higher class, or maybe she's just haughty and surly or whatever. And, and obviously this picture is a good one because it shows the, the pining lover who's writing this short lyrical love poem. It's often a love poem filled with over-the-top phrase and descriptions of beauty. It, it, it's a kind of poem that, that really is psychological or at least uh, subjective. It, it really gets into the feelings of that narrator. And uh, those feelings are often pained. They're, they're, I'm feeling love, but it hurts. You know? and, and it's also this kind of hurts so good kind of love. And, and, and that lends itself to descriptions in terms of uh, oxymorons like fire and ice or I, I'm both free and in bondage at the same time and that's how it's described in this kind of compressed paradox love does that to you there's also a standard theme of eternal youth and love are sustained because of the the verses that are being written by the poet and and uh, there's also this kind of self-deprecation that's there that all right uh, I'm not worthy of you or or sometimes it's you are the one who is the inspiration, you're my muse, and I'm just this lowly person who, who must worship you at a distance. So that's, those are some of the basic conventions that were set up by Petrarch. And if you can see the, the sonnet here I've put over on the right, uh, I don't know if you speak Italian, but you'll see in a moment that, that this sonnet was translated by um, uh, British poets, and they tried to preserve many of these conventions and even some of the form of uh, Petrarch's original sonnet. So we have to fast forward to the early 16th century before the British started getting involved in translating it into English. And that began with Sir Thomas Wyatt. And this is actually a translation of that, that poem, uh, Petrarch's Sonnet 140. And, and um, the thing I want to point out to you here is he was trying to bring forward the rhyme scheme from the Petrarchan sonnet tradition. So you can see the final words of this harbor, residence, pretense, banner, 
suffer negligence, reverence, displeasure. You'll see in a minute that this is echoing the Italian rhyme scheme. And what Wyatt was not trying to do was to imitate a given rhythm. That would be an innovation that would be really brought in by another person in the mid 16th century, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. And he's the one who started to really give this alternating rhythm that became characteristic of, of so much of English verse, whether it's blank verse often used in drama or in um, iambic, tam iambic pentameter that's used in the sonnet tradition. So you'll see here on this second stanza where I have emphasized the um, the words here, my doubtful hope and eke my hot desire with shame fast cloak to shadow and refrain her smiling grace converted straight to ire and coward love then to the heart apace. Obviously I'm overly emphasizing it but I simply wanted you to start hearing that and that's very different than over here. She that me learneth to love and suffer and will that my trust and lust negligence be reigned by reason, shame, and reverence with his hardiness taketh this pleasure. It, it's, it's jarring. It's not trying really to have a consistent meter to it. Wyatt was trying for the rhyme. Surrey was trying for a, a more uh, consistent rhythm. He also broke it into different um, subsections. So we have quatrains, three sets of four lines. Whereas in, in Petrarch's tradition, you normally had two sets of four lines followed by two sets of three lines. In the English tradition, it would most often be three sets of four lines followed by a closing couplet. But we'll get to that in a second. One other thing I wanted to point out was that both of these men had their works published in a famous anthology published in the mid-century, mid-16th century, Toddles Miscellany. It was the real title was Songs and Sonnets. And that's like the very first time that we had the lyrical tradition of English poets uh, really kicked off and, and collected and published in a major way. All right, so that's kind of the background and history of, of uh, the sonnet in its earliest form. It wouldn't be Wyatt and Surrey who were really the, the masters of the English sonnet like others would be, but we, we appreciate them for their early efforts to adapt and adopt the Italian sonnet form. Okay, let's take a closer look at the form. And the one obvious thing is that you have a, a very standardized length. Um, this was not always the case in the Renaissance. They would consider a sonnet pretty much any short lyrical poem. But over time, that's, that's, that was not the case. And so you would have, uh, if something were not 14 lines, it would not be considered a true sonnet in time. And uh, this is the Petrarchan sonnet form. I actually wrote a sonnet about the sonnet form to try to illustrate it a little bit. And you can see over here on, on the right side that I have indicated the rhyme scheme. And <clears throat> there are only five rhymes in the whole poem, A, B, C, D, and E. And so the A rhyme is ong, and the B rhyme is ang, or, or I, I cheated a little bit, and ang is the other B rhyme I put in there. And then you have the C rhyme, which is earn, the D rhyme, which is ein, and the, and the E rhyme, which is end. So that follows in a very structured pattern, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. So ong, ang, ang, ong, ong, ang, ang, ong. So you can see that in the actual sonnet I've written there at the ends of those lines. And that is called the octave, first eight lines, octave eight. And it was followed by the sestet, the set of six lines. And that part of the poem was a little less rigid. This was a very standard arrangement of the rhyme, C, D, E, C, D, E. But essentially, it boiled down to any arrangement of three rhymes. Maybe not three um, couplets in a row, but, but pretty much anything else. So you could have C, D, D, E. Whatever, anyway, any combination of C, D, and E. Um, now you'll see over here on the left side that I've indicated something called the volta, and that's Italian for turn. And this referred to a turn or change in the thought. And so, as I say in line nine, but then mid-poem often came a turn, the volta, past an octave set of lines. 
and that volta would mean the first half, or rather the first eight lines, the octave, would set up some kind of an issue or a problem, a riddle, uh, and then the last six lines would be an answer or a response or some other kind of uh, movement away from the initial eight lines. That pattern was sometimes followed in the, in the British tradition and sometimes not. Even when they adapted it to a different rhyme scheme, they would sometimes keep that volta after line eight before line nine. More typically though, the, the British form would move the volta down to between lines 12 and 13. In other words, there was a final couplet that would um, be set off as something different than the previous 12 lines. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. From Shakespeare's Song of 18, that's, that's a good example. So, um, there you, there you have it. Uh, this is the Petrarchan sonnet form adapted to English with iambic pentameter. From Italy, the sonnet, little song, a poem set to 14 lines in length, perfected to pentameters of strength in alternating iams, never wrong. Each line must rhyme with others all along, and so the sense upon the ear would hang, and as though from heartfelt harmony it sprang and flowed, in gem and making thoughts prolong. But then mid-poem often came a term, the volta passed an octave set of lines. The sestet that remained would frame an end, a lyric, not a story, something earned through praise and wit and images refined, both time and thought distilled as they are penned. And that, that is true, there's a kind of compression. Um, there, there are sometimes poems that seem to take on a bit of a story form, but mostly the sonnet is a non-narrative form, unless there's someone like uh, uh, Spencer, who wants to create a, a story out of concatenating a long set of different sonnets. Now, one word that I referred to in line eight here, enjambment, is an important one to understand as well. Enjambment, um, as I suggest in line seven and eight, it sprang and flowed in jambin, making thoughts prolong. Enjambment means carrying the thought over from the end of the line to the beginning of the next line. Essentially, avoiding any kind of end stop punctuation at the end of the line. And I'm actually demonstrating that between lines seven and eight. So this tends to keep the forward momentum going and, and keeps the form from feeling too stilted. Because after all, it is very regularized, very orderly, and it can seem a little bit artificial if you're always ending, um, if your voice is going down as it often does when we come to uh, in punctuation, um, and instead it can give it a more natural feel as it moves along and, and, and really effectively hides the rhymes inside of the poem because you're not pausing and saying, hey, here's a rhyming word at the end of each line. So that's an important word to know, French word enjambment. All right, so as far as the content goes for the British sonnet, you're going to see a lot of things here that are carried over directly from the Italian tradition especially that major theme of love. Now, love in the, in the Petrarchan tradition was more platonic, all right? It wasn't about um, consummating love physically. It was more about this, these enormous feelings that come about at a distance, especially the, the unrequited love that happens when you never will be able to hook up with your lover or would-be lover. And that unrequited love was something that uh, Sidney um, would would narrate in his longer, did I say Spencer before? I meant Sidney. Sir Philip Sidney in his Astrophel and Stella, a famous poem of unrequited love, a famous um, sonnet sequence, so a, a narrative set of, of sonnets that he published in 1591. Um, but back to the, uh, the Renaissance, excuse me, the, the British tradition of the sonnet would conjoin the physical with the platonic. In other words, it wasn't merely platonic, and, and you, would, you would even see sonnets take on a form of a kind of seduction poem, and the logic often went like this. Um, you're so beautiful that your beauty needs to live forever. I can help you out with that. That's the kind of how, how that would run. Now, these would also maintain that kind of uh, pained, pining feel, and, and that would, would often be expressed, as I said before, by oxymoron. So this is, this is what Wyatt translated in Petrarch. I find no peace and all my war is done. 
peace and war. I fear and hope. I burn and freeze like ice. And you'd compile a lot of these, and, and you'd really get this feeling of the, the poor guy is just really suffering from his love. Uh, these, these poems also tended to use what they sometimes called ekphrasis, or vivid description. And they would sometimes use what they called a blazon, which is a head-to-toe description, or a kind of cataloging of the various features, typically the outside features of, of the desired loved one. So this is the beginning of uh, Sonnet 64 from Edmund Spencer, coming to kiss her lips, such grace I found, me seemed I smelled the garden of sweet flowers, and this begins a whole conceit or extended metaphor where he, he takes one of her body parts and compares it to a flower, and this goes on beyond what I've just excerpted here. Uh, the dainty odors from them threw around for damsels fit to deck the lovers, their lovers' bowers. Her lips did smell like unto jilly flowers, her ruddy cheeks like unto roses red, her snowy brows like buttled bellamores, excuse me, budded bellamores, her lovely eyes like pinks but newly spread. And he goes down and, and you know, and even gets a little bit racy as he goes along. But this was fairly traditional that you would do a head to toe description, um, a kind of vivid, worshipful appreciation of one's lover. The other themes that would be prominent within the sonnets from, from uh, the Renaissance, the British Renaissance, would include a whole set of ideas around time, the brevity of time, or the, the need to extend into eternity what is, is passing, uh, whether it's love or physical love or beauty, change, mortality, death. Sometimes that mortality and death theme could take on a, a more reverential or religious component, or it could be combined with some of these um, love poems or seduction poems. Writing itself became a prominent topic in many of, of these. It, this is a genre that's very self-aware, not just of the writing process, but also um, aware that other people are practicing sonnets and writing sonnets of similar themes. Okay, so as far as a timeline for the British sonnet tradition, I, meant, I mentioned that Wyatt and Surrey, the first ones who brought the Italian tradition into English, they were published in Toddles Miscellany in 1557. And then we kind of fast forward where it really starts kicking off is when uh, Sir, Sir Philip Sidney writes his Astrophel and Stella. He circulated this in manuscript form in 1582, and then in 1591 he finally published it, um, popular demand. I mean, people love this whole story that he was telling in, uh, in a set of sonnets turned together. And the 1590s then really stood out as this high point of lots of authors writing sonnets, tens of thousands of, of sonnets in, in the Renaissance. Shakespeare came along at the, at the waning part of this tradition and published his sonnets in 1609, and they still are very prominent as representative of, of the period, but they are not exclusive, and, and there are others that really were more, more popular than his. Uh, fast forwarding to uh, the devotional poets in the, in the early 1630s and 40s, um, we have George Herbert's The Temple published in 1633, and even beyond that you would have Milton publishing his sonnets or writing his sonnets. So the, the sonnet tradition would continue and be a kind of staple. It wouldn't quite have the same prominence that it had right before the turn of, of the 17th century. And then it, if I wanted to, I could have uh, stretched this forward in time and shown an entire tradition um, that, that went steadily into the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, even the 21st century, the sonnet has become a workhorse of lyrical poetry for writers of English.